Well, Nathan gave us some good insight into uh, the foundation of the university and where some of the modern university is going since we have sort of left God behind. Uh, From a Christian perspective, humans are intrinsically dignified because man is created in God's image. And so what is the source for morality is God. God is the foundation for morality. Humans have human dignity because God made them in his image. If there is no God, then perhaps that situation uh, falls apart. As Peter Singer from Princeton says that in his book, Unsanctifying of Human Life, there is no such thing as the sanctity of human life if there is no sanctifier of human life. He talked also about pornography and about modern-day pornography and how it's changed even in 20 years to being very brutal, just like many of our other systems of entertainment we watch on television. We're desensitized to things of the past, and we want more and more degrading entertainment. It's amazing to look at the statistics, 260 new sites daily that pop up on the Internet. 89% of pornography comes from the United States and is shipped around the world. 4.2 million uh, sites are pornographic. That is 12% of the entire Internet. 25% of all searches every day are searches for pornography. We are in a sexually saturated society. And it has demonstrative uh, problems with respect to relationships. It is literally undignifying of humanity. It ends up not being very pro-feminist. It is degrading to women, to men, to families, and to societies. And while human trafficking and sex uh, slavery seem to get unanimous consent as being unjust, wrong, evil. Perhaps because it seems to be involuntary, taking someone against their will. Perhaps it is the case that while pornography begins voluntarily, it leads to be something that is rather involuntary and addicting and destructive, and there's a producer-consumer relationship of this. Our next uh, speaker, Chrissy Moran, uh, is going to be, uh, the title here is Ex-Porn Star Tells All. We're going to have an interview with Chrissy Moran, who was born again and now is born again, and we're going to hear about her life. I'm not going to say much about her bio. I'm going to let her tell her own story, but let me begin by uh, having uh, the couple that are going to interview Chrissy um, Come on up right after I give their bios. Uh, Brent Alcon is a pastor of soul care and seminary ministries at Faith Church here in Lafayette, Indiana. He graduated with his master's in aerospace engineering from Purdue, and he has a Ph.D. in Old Testament studies. He's married to Janet, has been for 20 years, and has two children, Joshua, who is 16, and Chris, who is 14, And Janet serves there as the director of women's ministry at Faith Church. Go ahead and please welcome Brent and Jana. Chrissy Moran, again, has uh, the past that she's going to talk about. Uh, It's been a a real pleasure and privilege for me over the last few months to talk with her about this upcoming symposium time that she would uh, help us to gain insight into that industry, into that community, into that life. And it's been fantastic for me to really put, um, see her as a person uh, rather than something that you know, the internet might depict through pixels as some, some image that is not her. She is a human being. She has longings, feelings, ambitions, desires to be cared for, 
to love. That's who she's been since she's been a little girl, and like many of us, she took a different path. And she's going to tell us about that. Rather than giving a long bio, I want to let Chrissy tell her own life story. Her website is newchrissymoran.com. Welcome, please, Chrissy Moran. Chrissy, it's a great privilege to have you here today, and uh, my wife and I want to thank you for just sharing your story. I think it's an encouragement. I've listened to your story before in your uh, previous interviews, so I'm thrilled. I think you're a courageous young lady who is going to tell your story today, and I think it'll be a, a, a good and solid challenge for us all. I want to welcome you to the Indiana here and to <laughs> Purdue University, the University of Indiana. So welcome. <laughs> I know this is your first time in Indiana, and uh, you have never been to this part of the country, so uh, welcome to the greatest place to go in the winter during, um, in, for right here in Indiana. Uh, where are you originally from? I'm originally from Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville, Florida. And what is your favorite thing about Florida? Um, the weather. The weather, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> obviously. I understand, Chrissy, that you are currently married. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I'm and um, how long have you been married now? I got married on May 11th, so three more months is a year. Three more months? Yeah. Oh, still a newlywed. newlywed. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Outside of loving to share your story, and again, that's a courageous thing that you're doing, what are some of your favorite aspects about uh, married life now in contrast to your former life? Yeah, well, um, I did cohabitate a lot in, in my past, so being married is a little bit different. I actually learned how to cook. I like to cook for my husband, and um, I just I enjoy um, our relationship and our closeness and the way he treats me. And, and you're um, ready to go back home and watch movies with him again, yes, right? Yes, I'm ready to just go home and watch Netflix. <laughs> this is very. This makes me very nervous sharing my story every single time. What is the favorite thing your husband loves you to cook? Um, taquitos. Taquitos. I think that's how you say it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Janet, could you learn how to cook that? Maybe I can try some we'll of those as well. Later. I know you travel around the United States and around the world to share your story. What are some of the most, um, or one of the favorite memories you have of sharing your story? What city, um, what favorite experience do you have in that regard? Well, um, I have a lot of great experiences. Um, one would be going to South Africa. That was really neat. Um, but I think the most memorable um, time was when I went to Seattle and um, got to share my story with um, Mars Hill Church in Mark Driscoll. And um, Mark was somebody that I really looked up to. I had been following his, his teachings for a while mm -hmm. when I left the industry, especially about um, men and relationships. And mm -hmm. it was almost like um, he kind of prepped me for marriage in a way. <laughs> it taught me what to look for in a man and what I deserved. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So Seattle was one of your favorite places. Yes. Um, you know the Super Bowl is tomorrow night? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I told her about that right before this. Um, rooting for Seattle Seahawks, I'm assuming? Sure. Sure, oh, sure. all right. <laughs> Great. Do you know who they're playing? Um, That's our, don't worry about oh. that one. <laughs> was it Broncos? Yes, it is it the Broncos, was. way to go, way to go. Before we get into your story, Chrissy, and um, uh, why don't we just kind of go to the heart of what you would like the those in the audience here to learn from your story, we're here about human sex trafficking and, and um, pornography may be kind of a, um, doesn't resonate with that subject necessarily on the first thought, but um, what would you like people to know here right off the bat before you share your story, and I'm assuming your story will illustrate all of this very um, profoundly, but uh, what would you like the folks to go away with tonight? Well, there's a few things. Um... You know, a lot of people will say that sex trafficking is different than porn because we choose to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, the truth is I did choose the path that I went into, um, but it is enslaving all the same. Um, I got into the industry, and um, a lot of people, you know, one of the things that keeps women enslaved in that industry is 
um, monetarily. Sure. You get used to a certain mm -hmm. kind of life. And a lot of times the women can't make that kind of money out of the industry. So even um, the world's most famous porn star, Jenna Jameson, just went back into the industry and she's made millions of dollars. And she is still going back to the industry. She just went back in a couple of months ago. Then hmm. there's a um, porn star, Houston. She also went back in the industry. She lost her real estate job and um, it's really hard to get away from that because they found out who she was and she lost hmm. her job. Um, and then you have, you, you'll, you know, your, your um, resume, when you have 10 nice. years missing, yeah. you know, what do you put there? Um, it's, it's very, that part of it is, is really hard. It's a financial trap. Um, then there's the mental aspect of it. You know, when I got into the industry, it wasn't something I really sought out to do, but um, I got into it at a very low point in my life. And the men that I knew um, at that time in my life, the people who I worked for, um, the people that I dated, they're all encouraging. Um, I felt as if that was the only thing I could do. Mm. And when the men that you're dating and living with are saying, you know, you're doing a great job, and mm. you know, it kind of, you get stuck in this place where you really believe that that's all you're good for. Yeah. And so that can be enslaving as well. And then even leaving the industry, I've been out of the industry for seven years, but you would think I was still in it because I've signed my rights away to mm. a website, to photos, to videos, and all of that. Still so active. I'm still a slave to the industry, even though I do not, not in the industry. Okay. So. Well, that's very important points for us to recognize as we hear your story tonight, that there is an enslaving aspect of pornography. So can you speak to this observation? Um, Everyone who associates with pornography is obviously not a sex trafficker. So somebody involved in pornography, watching it, producing movies, they're not inherently going to go down the road of being a sex trafficker. But every sex trafficker has associations with pornography. And I know you're not in the um, um, sex trafficking, you weren't a sex slave in the forced sense of that, but... Um, is that true in your observation that every sex trafficker has associations with pornography? And in what way could you speak to that, if at all? Well, I think that, um, I think that pornography fuels um, sex trafficking. Um, I think that um, a lot of um, sex traffickers use um, porn to train the women that they're trafficking. And, they also shoot the women, um, the w women they're trafficking doing porn. And a lot of the stuff online is with women who haven't consented at all. Okay, okay. thank you, Chrissy. Now, um, what the audience here and online is here for is to hear your story. So uh, I would like you to maybe frame your story, you know, as a childhood and then moving on into the teen years, how you entered into the industry and then um, ultimately how you got out and what life is like now. So around that kind of direction, and then Janet and I will kind of pop in here with some questions as you go, but um, how did it begin? Tell me about your childhood dreams and where all of this started. Because I'm assuming you didn't wake up one day and say, I want to be a porn star, right? No. As a matter of fact, I was very um, against porn before I got into it. Um, I guess I started off, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. My parents um, were married. They, they ended up getting divorced, but when I was, my earliest memories are around the age of four. And my dad was teaching um, Sunday school in a church, and my mom um, would sing in the choir, and we went to church um, every Sunday. Um, my dad taught me, even as a little girl, even as a young as I can remember, that he told me that if anybody ever touched me, that he would kill them. And he said, you know, he talked to me about being a virgin until I got married, and that's kind of what he instilled inside of me. Um, but when I was only four years old, it was the first time I was molested, and um, 
my brother and I were at a neighbor's house and swimming in his pool, and that is when it happened. Um, and I didn't tell anybody because I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I was scared. So, um, yeah, so it was um, very confusing. I mean, I was a little girl. Was that an ongoing um, molestation over time, or was that a one-time event? That was a one-time event, but, they, you know, throughout my childhood, things like that happened with different people. Okay. Um, when, my, when, when, I got, when I was around 11 years old, my dad started drinking, and he had a lot of drunk friends that he would bring around, and, um, and I, I could tell that a lot of his friends were looking at me and, you know, in lustful ways. You know, and my dad was very vocal about raising me to be a virgin, and um, he had this kind of a little bit of an obsession with it, um, the way he talked about it all the time, and um, especially when he was drinking, it, it was very strange. But it was confusing because the people that he would bring around us were, um, I knew that they were lusting, even as when I was a little girl. And, um, and then some of, like, um, one of his friends had a son that lived with us, and he knew a lot about sex. And, you know, he tried, he did, you know, tried things with me all the time, and it was very difficult. And, you know, like, I wanted to tell my parents, but his dad's abusive, he'll beat him. It's just a lot of... Um, you were afraid to tell. Yeah, I was afraid. I was afraid to tell, and I didn't want to get this kid in trouble, and, you know, all the parents are, you know, dads, they're all single dads, and they're looking at me in these kind of ways. You know, you're so pretty. Mm. It, like, you could tell they're, they were kind of, they were very creepy, and my dad, you know, even though he was teaching me one thing, he was putting me in the pathway of, of this evil. Okay. Christy, um, how many of the folks in the industry, and when I say the industry, I am talking about the porn industry, and I think that's the word you use in reference to the industry. Mm -hmm. um, the ladies that you were around, um, is, the, is being sexually molested at an early age, is that just part of the regular experience? How many, how many ladies, men, um, would you estimate to be, have that similar experience in their background? Well, the statistic says anywhere between 66 to 90 percent of the women. 66 to 90 percent? Yes. It's not a definite figure, but um, I did work with a, um, an outreach to women in the sex industry, and um, so I know a little bit of, you know, what happens, and I would say that that's accurate. Um, most of the women that I know have been um, sexually abused okay, as a child. Okay, so you see a common factor in that an older individual sexually molests a younger child and that child grows up and submits to further harm in, in these kinds of ways. So that's the cycle you're seeing. Mm -hmm, definitely. Okay. This may sound obvious, but just since we're talking about human dignity, how harmful was that molestation in your ultimate um, train of thought leading you down this path? How harmful was that? It was very harmful. Um, I would say it kind of taught me that um, that sex sex was something that um, people wanted and that they would take, even you know, even if you aren't giving it. Um, kind of like a um, something that's not sacred. Okay. Okay. Tell me a little bit about as you grew up in your teen years. Um, I think in your testimony with Mark Driscoll, you mentioned a lot about um, wanting to be a mom, wanting a baby, uh, playing with Barbie dolls and all that kind of stuff. Tell us about your aspirations in your teen years a little bit as you grew. Yeah, um, ever since I was a little girl, I wanted to be a mom. I wanted to get married and be a mom. That's the only thing I really wanted. Um, and, you know, my parents ended up getting divorced when I was 13, I believe, and when they got divorced, um, I lived with my dad for a little while, and 
it was really hard because his behavior was erratic and I, he was getting worse and worse drinking and things like that. So I ended up moving in with my mom and, um, and when I lived with them, I was very rebellious. I didn't feel like I was getting the attention that I needed. Um, and when I was about, I guess, 16, um, I had my first boyfriend, um, and I realized um, that having that kind of love and attention really filled this empty place inside of me that felt that I needed um, to be filled, that I needed love and attention and all that kind of stuff. So I learned um, at that age that that, that, was, that worked, you know, that yeah. kept me going. Um, when I was 17, though, um, I ended up getting pregnant. Um, and my boyfriend told me, he had always told me, because we dated for like two years, and he said, if you ever get pregnant, we'll have the baby, and we'll get married, and we'll have a family. And Everything you wanted. Yeah. Or everything you wanted. Yeah, it was some, it's what is the, like, the only thing I really wanted. And, but when that happened, he... Um, he told me that he couldn't marry me, that he, he, he was in college. I was still in high school, and he needed to finish school. And um, he ended up taking me to get an abortion. Mm. And um, it would, that wasn't something that I really wanted to do at all. Um, I didn't feel like I had a choice at the time. And um, it was like the third most devastating thing in my life at that point. Mm. And um, I, I suffered a lot of depression after that, like everything from the sexual abuse and the, and, um, the abortion and the, sexual the divorce. Abuse and the sexual abuse in the past, coming mm. back, and then the abortion and yeah. the, your mom and dad's divorce. Yeah, and I was in high school, so going back to school was really difficult because I told one person and, and it ended up getting mm. around. And at, at our high school... Um, well, I guess thing, I don't know if it's the same now, but at that time, like people just they didn't like you, <laughs> they didn't like me. They I, I was judged, I was criticized, and pretty much um, didn't have any friends when I graduated high school. Was that your first abortion at that moment in time? Your first and only abortion? It was my first one. Okay. And there, there is some other. Um, was were your parents aware of that at that moment in time as well? Okay. Yeah. How did you end up from that point in time being in the industry? So can you tell us, tell the folks here and online, just from that point on, what, were the, what was the path toward the industry? Yeah, I think um, my story was to search for love and whatever it took to have somebody you know, telling me that I was pretty, I was worthy. Um, I didn't really have much guidance in knowing what to, how, how to choose people to date and um, no encouragement in that respect. So I kind of learned on my own through, through what I saw on TV, <laughs> what I heard in music. Um, you know, and I grew up listening to a lot of country music, so. Um, <laughs> Looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, it's a kind of like I, I, I believed in a fairy tale um, and, you know, I grad ended up graduating, getting out of high school. After I graduated, um, I moved out of my mom's house. Um, I had my mom, my stepdad suggested that I move out um, shortly after that so that, um, you know, I could get my own place and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And. Um, I was kind of like shocked because I thought they would want me to stay a little bit longer, but um, I ended up moving in and, you know, in my desperation, I, I, I moved in with a couple of roommates that didn't work out and then I ended up moving in with the first guy that I ever lived with. And, um, and that started this cycle of living with different men. Mm -hmm. and, um, for the same reasons of looking for their affection, their attention, mm -hmm. and um, their love. Yeah, and, um, and I learned that, you know, I could use sex to earn love. Mm. And um, so that's what I did. And when the relationships would break up or if I would sense something was happening, I would somehow 
find somebody else and move into the next house, move in with the next person. And one of the things um, that I found was that most of the men did watch porn. And I was very much against it. I was so jealous, I couldn't handle it. Um, and I think a lot of women feel that way. It's, it's really um, a hard thing. Um, but I guess eventually, um, well, my opinion never did change, even when I was in it, to be honest with you. But I just kind of felt when I got into it that that's, um, just a part of what men like, and like, if, if he's going to watch it, why don't, what if I'm doing it, then he'll have like this ultimate perfect mm. woman, yeah. and I know it sounds really bad, but that's how I felt. Okay. So what was your first entry into the porn industry? Was it, um, I think I heard on your testimony, your somebody wanted to just uh, take some modeling photos. Yeah. And, um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, pretty, well, before I ended up going to the industry, I kind of, I guess I kind of tested the waters. Um, I ended up, I was working a regular job in an office and I ended up getting a, a second job at Hooters. So I kind of tested the waters. I was the super shy girl. I didn't make any money. But, <laughs> a super shy girl going to Hooters. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do very well at that job. But, <laughs> okay. but that's kind that's of... That's probably not a bad thing. So. <laughs> but there was something about it during that time in my life that I was like, wow, they think I'm pretty enough. Mm. So this, this um, cycle of, you know, if the men aren't giving... If the men I'm dating aren't giving me the attention and love. Now these, you know, I learned that, you know, I could get it this way. These people are telling me I'm pretty and all this kind of stuff made me feel good. Feels Because um, I was never considered the pretty girl or anything, so it really filled the, that empty spot inside. And um, so that was me testing the waters. A few years later, I ended up putting my pictures on a website, um, a, like a dating website. And people started emailing me about doing work um, and doing shoots. And then I ended up finding a modeling website and I put my pictures up there and I thought, well, we'll see what happens. And they were just like snapshots, um, not professional pictures. And people started contacting me through that site as well, asking me to do, to do modeling shoots. But the shoots weren't um, bikini shots. They were all nude or topless. Mm. So, and you didn't know that go, until you went in. No, actually, I did know that. Okay. So I turned I turned a lot of it down because in the beginning, then I ended up going through um, a few really hard breakups, and I just didn't feel good about myself anymore. And I ended up taking my first yep. sh shot shoot. Um, I met a photographer in a hotel room. Um, and he had one light and a camera. And, you know, was, you bring a bag of lingerie, and he shot me the first, the first night, and then the next day he shot me during the day. But, um, I mean, I can still remember, I mean, I can just picture what it, standing there in the room and being asked to remove, mm -hmm. you know, different articles of clothing. And I remember I was shaking and I was like, what am I doing? But there was, in my mind, I guess, from being sexually abused, I learned how to disassociate. So even though I was present, I wasn't connected to what was happening. Like I was just becoming what he was telling me to, to become, you know, look at me this way, turn your head this way. and. I wasn't really present. How long did that last? How long were you in the industry? I was in the industry for six years. For six years. As you reflect on those six years, and obviously we don't want the details of that, but could you describe the, the dignity of that, if there was any? Or, and we're here talking about sex trafficking, human slavery, and some people would say, oh, that is an exciting, glamorous, pleasure-filled lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Is it really? Um, the men treat you well. Did the 
Um, you cope with disassociation by, by trying to disassociate yourself from these kinds of events. Um, can you tell us about, maybe here's a question for us. Were you happy? Um, I wasn't happy. I think I had um, moments where I felt like I was accomplishing something, mm. or I tried to believe that I was doing something that was empowering. Um, but ultimately, it wasn't empowering. I'm doing what somebody's telling me to do, and they don't care about my feelings or what my day's like or what I'm going through or what got me there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's just acting and performing for somebody, whatever they want wanted me to do. What was your view? your identity of yourself during that time as you developed and as you grew from a child to um, a porn star. Who was Chrissy in your mind? What was your identity? I don't know who I was during that time. There's a lot of things that, that I can't even remember. And then there's memories that I have and I'm like, how did I even live through that? Um, I don't know who I was during that time. I didn't know who I was till after I left that industry. Okay. My whole goal was to be sexy, to do whatever it took to be one of the best. Like those were my goals. Yeah. Okay. And there's nothing empowering about being treated like an object. What were some of the human in indignities that were um, accomplished upon you, you had to treating life, about. treating you like an object. And what regularly did you see around that industry? Well, um, you know, how did the men treat you? It's, How's that? <laughs> I'm like, where do I go with this question? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, for example, on a set. It's very common to be doing a scene and there's other men who are getting ready for their scene and preparing themselves. I guess that's a nice way to put it, while they're watching you. Um, there can be a lot of people on the set looking at you. Um, it's just... Okay. You and just, you were frequently in relationships with some of those men, and what were those relationships characterized by? Well, actually, when I was in the industry, I was in a relationship with one guy for three and a half of the years, and that's the person I worked with. But it was a very physically abusive relationship. So when the scenes weren't working um, the way that they should, he took it out on me. So there was that aspect of it, too. And Physi I'll, physical abuse. Yeah, physical abuse. Because okay. um, he would get frustrated if, if something wasn't working out on the set. And yeah, and um, so, yeah, that's the only person I worked with, but we were together three and a half years and he controlled every aspect of me being in the industry. Um, it wasn't until I dated him that I even considered working with men. And um, so he kind of took it to the next level, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Chrissy, um, you mentioned that you learned a coping mechanism called disassociation. And um, was that just something that you naturally, instinctively tried to learn to deal with this? Or did somebody teach you that? Yeah, I didn't, I don't know. I, I just did it. I don't know where it came from. I think it's a psychological thing that people do when they're dealing with trauma. So you wouldn't view this as... It's interesting you use the word trauma because um, some people would look at this and say, this is, this is life, this is pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, if it feels good, do it. So what harm is there? And you just use the word trauma mm -hmm. in regard to what you went through. Um, what other coping mechanisms did you learn or maybe some of the other, those others involved in the pornography industry? What other coping mechanisms did they learn and do for the trauma. Yeah, it's, it's frequent, very frequent that there is alcohol or drugs on a set. Um, I didn't do that because the way I dealt with it was, that's how I dealt with it. But it's, it's very common for alcohol and drugs. I've worked with a lot of people who have been under the influence. Okay. Chrissy, how did you 
ultimately decide to leave the industry? What were the steps? Well, after that abusive relationship, um, I didn't date for maybe a year. It just didn't happen. <laughs> I was seeking relationships and it didn't work out. And then I ended up meeting a guy who was actually a really nice guy and um, he had a son and I thought, oh, this is great. It's a family, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, he didn't work in porn, but he worked in mainstream um, doing movies and, and stuff like that and stunts and things like that. And when I met him, I thought that we would be a family and that we would get married. And um, I had it in the back of my mind. So you were still hanging on that goal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. It's so sad. Um, but yeah, I thought he would be a good husband. Um, so... Anyway, that didn't um, work out that way. He ended up getting more involved in the industry when he couldn't pay bills. And then I got him jobs shooting porn. Mm -hmm. um, and so he started shooting some of it. He frequently had it on his computer. Um, and like I said, this is a problem I had with every man that I was with. So he would be editing the photos late at night. Um, showing them to his friends, bragging about all these women. And, um, but that was just like everybody else. I just thought, well, he, I could, you know, maybe he could still be a good husband. That's just how men are. That was my mentality. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, I mentioned to him several times, like, why don't we think of a way I can transition out of this? And, um, and he, he didn't really encourage it at all. He, um, he was like, well, what else are you going to do? You're not going to make any money doing anything else. Like, um, so he wasn't very encouraging, but I had it, like, my heart was in a place that I thought, well, I think I still had this hope that if somebody really loved me, they would help me transition out of it and, and um, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. <laughs> but that didn't happen in this relationship. And the more he got involved shooting porn and, and all that kind of stuff, um, I could see the more he, um, you know, lusting after other women, the more it didn't really matter to him if I was in porn, if I wasn't, and that I wasn't as important to him. And then it wasn't until he went to shoot a film um, in New Mexico, and he left for, we spent every day together in this relationship. We were together a year and eight months every day, literally, together. We didn't go a day without each other. And he went out of town to work on a, on a movie, and um, the insecure part of me was like, when he left, kissed, kissed him goodbye. I'm like, don't go to a strip club. Um, <laughs> but that's exactly what ended up happening. And even though I was in the industry, I didn't work with other men, and I was very jealous. And I always wanted, you know, this... Yeah husband, man, that's supposed to treat me with dignity and respect and love. And um, anyway, so he went out of town and called me. He called me up, and he was drunk one night. And um, I said, what, um, asked him where he was. And he said he was, um, where did he say he was? He said he was at P.F. Chang's at 2 a.m. And I could hear music. <laughs> <laughs> I could hear music, and I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> Like, uh, I can hear the music, and he's like, yeah, they make it a nightclub at night. And I knew he was lying. <laughs> I knew he was lying, and he was slurring, so I knew he was drunk. So anyway, he, he did his best at trying to convince me that that's where he was. And um, that night I went to bed, and I just felt sick to my stomach. And I um, actually started praying. And I really? was like, yeah. I started praying, and I was like, God, it's let me know the truth. Um, so God kind of started working on my heart. And the next day, he called me and told me the truth, that he was at, the, at a strip club, and tried to justify it. And, you know, well, you do porn. Why do you care? And, and you know, and it probably doesn't make sense to a lot of you, but um, the desire in my heart was for something more. And just knowing that this was another you know, year and eight months that I wasted mm. with the wrong person still. Yeah. Um, it was hard. And when I got off the phone with him, um, I, you know, hung up the phone and I fell down in my kitchen floor and I just started crying and praying. And um, 
I was just so confused. Like, I was in this industry for so long. I kind of morphed myself into what I thought everybody wanted me to be in order to hmm. earn respect and love and all the things um, that I really wanted and still didn't have it. And so I kind of just fell to the floor and I said, God, if you're real, I need you to speak to me. I need you to let me know. And uh, everything that I know about love is twisted and perverted and just isn't right. And this isn't what I believe Mm. in. So the next couple days, I kind of made a list of all the pros and cons (laughs) staying with this in this relationship. My mind was so um, confused, so I had to do that because I'm like, am I crazy? This is just, because really a part of me was like, this is how men are. And on the other hand, it was, there has to be something better. So I was very confused. Um, So I made this list. I I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep for a couple of days. And I prayed a lot. And then I ended up going out there where he was in New Mexico because he wanted me to come out and meet the cast and hang out because to him it wasn't a big deal. Like he didn't know what I'm going through. And he honestly didn't even care. Um, we didn't know each other that way. And I didn't realize that till later. We didn't even know each other in that intimate of a way mm. that he would even be sensitive to how I was feeling or what I was going through. So you knew each other sexually, but you didn't know each other's hearts and desires and, and what you were actually going through emotionally. A, yeah, it was a very shallow relationship, especially oh. looking back from where mm-hmm. I am now. I can see it so clear. So I ended up going out there, and he introduced me to um, the director's son, who he was hanging out with, who he went to the strip club with. And we went to dinner, and he was really nice at first, and then he started drinking, and he started acting rude. Mm. (laughs) He was just like, why is it you're in porn and you expect him not to go to a strip club? Don't you know that... Sometimes man will want to be, see a blonde. Sometimes the, mm. a guy will want mm. to see a brunette with big boobs. Like yeah. He tried to justify it that way. And, um, and it just hurt. It felt like, it just felt like a knife going in my heart. And he's like, I'm married and I have kids. And my wife knows that I'm going to go do whatever I want to do as long as I come home to her. That was the attitude. And then after dinner, we hung out. And eventually we got in a fight, <laughs> me and this guy. And um, I don't remember what I said, but he ended up kicking us out of the room and um, went back to our room. And then my boyfriend was mad at me. Um, But anyway, the next day, I went to meet everybody else on the set. And there were several men. And um, I was sitting in a director's chair. And then there was another director's chair on one side and one on the other side. And then all the other men were standing around. My husband was introducing me. He introduced me to the guy on my right, and then he introduced me to the guy on my left. And I did that backwards. Anyway, <laughs> so he introduced me to this guy named Chris. And as a, after I, you know, hi, whatever, they, they ended up getting a text. And the guys were passing around the cell phone. And I was like, what is, what are you looking at? And then one of the guys says, oh, it's so-and-so's wife, and she's topless. Mm. And I was just like, great. (laughs) Like, um, I felt so uncomfortable, even though I was in the industry. And I said, I don't know where I got the bravery, but I said, well, I would hope that my husband wouldn't be showing pictures of me like that. Even though I was in the industry, I still... Hung on to that. Like hope. And um, they all laughed. And then the guy to my left said, if that was my wife, I wouldn't be showing those pictures to anyone. That would only be for me. And I was, I hadn't heard anybody say that like in my whole life. And I was just like, whoa. Like he defended me. And what he said was just, just shocking to me. And um, anyway, so I didn't know what, I didn't know what to think of it. But later on, when my um, boyfriend was was filming, he came up to me, um, this guy Chris came up to me and he was like, so what do you do for a living? 
And so um, I do modeling, because I didn't tell people I did porn. Um, I said, I do modeling. He's like, what kind of modeling? I said, you know, um, Hawaiian tropics, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Calendars with cars. I just made up a bunch of stuff. And, <laughs> and he was, he just said, uh, he just kept asking me, well, what else, what else? And finally, I could tell he didn't believe me. So I just sure. said, I just do, I do adult stuff. I do porn. And he said, I already knew that. And I said, really? He said, yeah, your boyfriend, has, that's all he's been talking about. He's been showing people your photos. Mm. And um, mm. there was just something weird about knowing that everybody knew this about me before I even got there. And I'm trying to carry myself with dignity. And then to know that everybody already knows and that I'm already looked down upon and all that. And I just felt so ashamed in that moment. And then he, he said, let me ask you something. And he, I said, what? He said, do you believe in God? Hmm. And I said, I was like, yeah. And he goes, well, do you believe that he, he loves you and he created you for something better? And um, There's something better maybe you were hoping for down the road that you were longing for? Yeah. And he's like, you don't have to live your life like this. And that was the first time I saw a glimpse of like mm. hope like mm. real hope, and um, and I knew what he was saying was right because it it made sense. It resonated with my heart. And he said, um, he said, do you do you want to keep? You know, he asked me if I wanted to keep. You know, wanted if I wanted to accept Jesus as my savior and follow Jesus. And I already knew a lot about Jesus because I grew up mm -hmm. with that. And I, you know, definitely took the wrong path. But um, I felt like Jesus was calling me back mm. to him in that moment because I had said so many prayers. And, um, and this person talking to me about, you know, like I deserve something better and just the way it all happened. And it just made sense. And he's like... Um, had you connected in your mind that you were calling out for God in prayer and then a few yeah. days, weeks later, this man came up and offered you hope and... Jesus. Yeah. Definitely. You connected that. Okay. Yeah, I definitely connected with that. And um, he's, uh, so anyway, he asked me if I wanted to go outside and pray. And I said, <laughs> yeah. And, he's, and he said, okay, um, let me tell your boyfriend that we're going to go outside. I don't want him to get mad. So he told my boyfriend we're going outside to pray. And he was like <laughs> confused. He was like way far away. So he was like looking at me like, what? <laughs> And so we went outside and prayed, and I cried, and I, I asked Jesus to come into my heart, and mm. I decided at that moment, it didn't matter what anybody else thought or said, that that's what I was going to do, that I was quitting the industry, and I was going to change my life, and I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I knew that that's what I was going to do, and that's what I did. That's what you did? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. What is, um, as you consider the time spent in the porn industry, during that time, would you consider yourself enslaved? Yeah. yeah. I was enslaved, definitely. Who are you now? Are you Chrissy, the former porn star? Are you Chrissy, the shamed? Are you Chrissy, the victim? What is your identity now? Well, I identify myself as a child of God, Amen. a daughter of the king, um, I know that I am worthy of love. Um, God has restored my dignity. He has given me a new life. He's mm. given me a marriage with a man that, that loves me, like really, really loves mm. me and respects He's me. He's given you all your hopes and dreams that you had as a little girl. Yes. yes. Do you consider yourself free now? Yes, I am free. Do those who harmed you during that time in the porn industry, um, are you angry with them? Are you bitter with them? Would you want vengeance upon them? That's a um, hard question. <laughs> um, I have my moments, but I have to say I really try to leave that, um, I really try to forgive and leave that in God's hands, the vengeance part. Um, you know, the, there are people that want to keep making money off of me and, yeah. and stuff like that. And it gets, it gets frustrating and it's, it's, it's really hard. But 
I know that even if nothing happens on, during this, you know, our time on this earth, that God will, you know, do we'll what make he has things to do. right. <laughs> yeah. Chrissy, is there anything else you would like to share with the audience um, um, before we kind of say thank you and the audience here or online? Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I just, um, I just hope that me sharing my story in some way shows you the woman bet- with the heartbeat behind the mm-hmm. movie, because I've worked with a lot of women who've come out of the sex industry, not just porn, but, um, sex trafficking and, um, other, and prostitution and, we're not objects and we do have feelings and emotions and hopes and dreams and all of that kind of thing. And we don't want to be enslaved. We don't want to, you know, it, sometimes our circumstances take us in the wrong direction and we make bad choices, but, um, I just hope it, I don't know, get, shows you some of the reality of the girl behind the movie. Yeah. Behind the porn star was a young lady who was searching for love, wanting to be a wife and a mother and Mm -hmm. wanting something that was more than that. And it sounds to me like you found it in the gospel of Jesus Christ as you cried out to God. And so, Chrissy, we are so encouraged by your story today. We're challenged by it as well. So, again, I want to thank you, Janet, and I want to thank you for coming and sharing your story here at uh, Purdue University. So um, thank you, Chrissy. Thank you.